I've talked to guys who have hunted deer that are wearing the GPS collars where I'm looking at the data. And when you ask them to tell you what they think is going on with these deer, and then you do a juxtaposition, and you actually look at what these deer are doing, the nine times out of 10, they're always way so far off, you wouldn't believe it. What is up, everybody? Eric Barber to my right this time, uh, repeat co-host. Eric, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Now, Eric, when I think of targeting terrorists, my mind immediately goes to deer hunting. Yeah. No, actually. Naturally. No, it actually doesn't. But for somebody, that is a very obvious cognitive link between those two things. We have Bill Thompson from Spartan Forge across from us right now. And we're going to talk all about Bill, what he's going, what he has going on with Spartan Forge, the app. And I think a lot of your background, Bill, because I think to explain the app and its functionality, the backstory behind it is really like, uh, that's, that's the foundation. Yep. So uh, I guess, yeah, without, without further ado, uh, Bill, uh, number one, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for coming in today. This is awesome. And then yeah, let's 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 kind of dive into your background, your history, military history, things like that, and then we'll kind of move forward from there. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm uh, Bill Thompson, as you said, and uh, uh, I'm the founder of Spartan Forge. It's a you know, hunting application that you guys have talked about. Um, I uh, joined the military when I was 17, and uh, retired here just last year in October. Um, for about the first 10 years of my military uh, time, I was, uh, what we call the green army, just like the normal everyday army. Um, uh, I was a military intelligence soldier and enlisted guy. Um, I spent a lot of that time doing signals intelligence, mostly, um, signal intelligence can just be like any peripheral, any, 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 any emanation that comes off of any type of device. So whether it's a cell phone or it's a radar or it's a jet or it's anything, uh, these things are always emanating either intentional or unintentional waveforms. And I, a lot of my early career was done doing analysis of that type of stuff. Uh, understanding, you know, uh, the techno technological side of all of the tools that were being brought to bear for soldiers. Um, probably, maybe, maybe that's about the first eight years. And then after that, um, the war really kicked off. I'd done a couple deployments at that point. Um, and then I'd gotten into targeting um, using again, emanations from electronic devices, you know, uh, that type of stuff. And my career kind of shifted into supporting unconventional units at that point. Uh, I was kind of part of like a feeder program. So I wasn't like a traditional, um, green beret or something like, you know, a lot of people here, special operations or there's, you know, there's JSOC and then there's CAG and then there's Delta. There's all of these different, um, organizations. I did support to those organizations. I was never part of one of them. Um, uh, a lot of my time was with three letter organizations doing support to those guys as an army guy. So it's confusing, sure. but, um, essentially, you know, a lot of the people inside of traditional groups like first group or 10th group or some of these other special forces, um, groups are focused on, um, you know, uh, direct mission, like, like uh, kinetic missions and that type of thing. Um, and don't have a lot of time to figure out, you know, what's the hottest, newest trend in cell phones and that type of stuff or in communications gear and that mm -hmm. type of thing. And in order to do a lot of the um, collection or exploitation on these things, it required you go sit, you know, somewhere on the East Coast in, in Maryland, something like that, learn about these things, learn about their, how they can be exploited and how they can feed a uh, traditional tactical, tactical commander's um, targeting cycle. So the, the commander has, you know, at the time when I was doing this work, I don't know what they call it anymore, but it was called like a JPL list. It'd be like your prioritized um, effects that you wanted to achieve in a particular target space. So, you know, we want to kill so-and-so bad guy or whatever. Um, and then from my side of the house, it was kind of figuring out what the target profile looked like um, from an electronic standpoint. Um, and then kind of en enabling the commander to make informed decisions based on the work that I was doing with, you know, whether it was... Um, collection or exploitation or reconfiguration of these types of devices. Um, and I did that for about 11 years um, and kind of <coughs> transitioned in and out of, from operations to um, technological development back to operations to te technolog technological development. A lot of the problems that we would run into is the pace of technology is so fast right. uh, and the government can't keep up with um, big business because um, 
the, the, the concerns are different. So when the military is making a capability to go after a particular device or something like that, um, they have to program for the money, they have to set up all of the framework that the government requires, then there has to be all of these, think of like OSHA or something like that. All mm -hmm. of the stuff that has to surround these things. Meanwhile, you know, communication companies are just like, next device, next device, next device, next device. I don't really care <laughs> about all of the other circumstances were market fo focused. So the military knew that they had a hard time keeping up with the pace of technology. So my, my, uh, I guess you, what you would say is I would go like operational assignment for like three years and then one year, two year of developing capability and advising people who are developing the capabilities that we'd use to prosecute the war from a signals intelligence, human intelligence, or all of these other type of communications intelligence, um, and then go back to operations and do that again, and then back to development, and, and, and just kind of that back and forth was about the last 11 or 12 years of my career. Sure. Wow. So like that back and forth, it'd be like, was that like you like almost like playing catch up? Like, hey, we got to focus on this so we can get you guys back up to speed as yeah, far as... Yeah, exactly. And, and just kind of prioritizing what, what had to be developed in the commercial side um, to support the government. So the government runs contracts, uh -huh. yep. and then these contracts can kind of develop capabilities against, you know, different types of whatever. Um, but a lot of times they just didn't have the right azimuth or didn't know exactly what they were trying to go down or where the military was going or what part of the country we were going to be in or which country we were going to be in or if we we're going after, you know, governmental or terrorists, um, you know, their, then their kits were different. And then it's just like, what was the focus? And then what effects did we want to achieve against these um, bad actors? Um, and th so my job was kind of to advise and point um, and uh, kind of let them know, you know, here's what a soldier can carry on his back if he's going to go do a, um, a mission in the middle of, you know, Afghanistan somewhere. You know, he might have 60 pounds of gear that he can take. And here are the battery, the size, weight, and power constraints for the batteries that they can take along to do a mission. You know, in addition to all of their normal kit, um, some of the guys who are carrying the most stuff would be like the Intel guys who would have like their normal pack out, their normal loadout, their normal rifle, their sidearm, their, their plates, their food that they needed, the water or the filtration devices that they needed, and then the batteries and the collection equipment or whatever they were doing out there. Um, so it was kind of to let them know what those requirements were and to make sure that they weren't too disjointed with what was actually happening in the force. And then okay. going back into the force and using those things or um, uh, you know, running out there alone and unafraid and doing these types of things and then coming back and saying, all right, now here's how the, the battlefield's changed. So that's kind of my career in a nutshell. Sure. Yeah, that's wild. So, yeah. like, I mean, I, in some ways, like, I felt, <laughs> or, like, so these guys aren't just getting fed information. Like, they've got the equipment to, like, procure information when they're in the field as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it all depends on, again, the commander's requirements. So the commander will have, like, priority intelligence requirements. Um, that kind of say, like, here's what we're trying to get done from an intelligence perspective. And then you kind of build your gear out based on that. So whether you're just doing straight collection or you're trying to, like, jam, you know, um, a communication signal before an, an assault or an operation yeah. um, to make sure. Or you're just or or the, the a, a lot of the concern, especially like 2015, uh, a, a lot of my support task force would be in the document and media exploitation realm. So. Right, you know, somebody's gone in there and killed all the bad guys, and that was my job to go in there with like my tape on my glasses and my pocket protector and, <laughs> and get all of the um, uh, equipment off the objective and try to extract as much intelligence value as possible sure. in the shortest amount of time and then relate that to the commander because a lot of the intel that would be on these objectives would be um, time sensitive. Yeah. So, okay, you, you know, if uh, Abu bad guy had, you know, a cell phone where he had messages on there talking about they're going to be doing an operation the next week or something like that. You didn't want to find out about that three months later. Yeah. You want to be able to feed the commander that intelligence right away and sure. say, hey, sir, there's, you know, and then and then try to look for modality or, or, or many points of contact on that intel. So not only was it here, but, you know, we found it in these documents or these diaries and it was here in this magazine or it was here in this and that and this. Yeah. So, you know, kind of corroborating, corroborate things. everything and put it all together and inform the commander again. Sure. that This is what was going on. So sure. Yeah. Was that would that stuff be like time sensitive as well from a standpoint of like maybe people might find out that, oh, these guys got hit and now you need to kind of like act on that information or before they can react to knowing that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, oh, all, it's I gotcha. all of those things. Yeah. Um, but but the, 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 the main idea here was um, speed and accuracy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and Bill, maybe talk a little bit about, so I, you and I chatted prior, uh, you know, a couple, 
That would have been last October. Yep. yep. Um, and one thing that you kind of relayed to me that I thought was fascinating is like, and, and actually has some parallels into the hunting world, but the intel, the surveillance, so like drawing parallels from like a hunt, you know, you're going in after this very specific buck, but maybe talk a little bit about your process as much as you can share that is of like from a surveillance standpoint, you know, you guys are, you're advising on very high odds, high stakes missions. So I guess maybe kind of talk a little bit about your background in the surveillance world and then maybe that'd be a good kind of parallel and uh, once we kind of get start talking about Spartan Forge. Yeah. So, I mean, from a surveillance perspective or like um, it's at the end of the day, both hunters and, you know, commanders in the military who are trying to prosecute effects on targets are they have a targeting problem. And the targeting problem just basically, you know, what are the tendencies of the target? Um, what can be exploited about the target? What information do we know? What information do we not know? Which is generally more important. Um and then isolating all of those variables and then figuring out what tools you can bring to bear to answer the questions. So it can be uh, thought of, you know, the implications of that statement are obvious in like the terrorist or in the governmental operations. You know, we, we have a, a target deck and here's what we know and here's what we don't know and here's, where we, here's the delta and here's what we need to get to that. The same thing can be said with like a white-tailed deer or, or any animal that you're pursuing, right? There's certain things you know about it, whether it's from... Um, uh, trail cameras or, you know, your own observation, glassing a field or, you know, uh, any, any one of those things. But then also for the hunter and specifically wh where we're trying to get with Spartan Forge is to try to get people to consider things that they might not know or be able to um, conduct those types of, uh, what would you call it, that collection of that information in a way that's not too intrusive. You know, you don't want to be walking into an animal's bedroom where they're bedding during the hunting season and then hope, you know, you've gone in there three or four times trying to learn as much as you can. You're like, yeah. you know, getting a hunter to understand maybe the end of the season is the time to be that sure. intrusive. And then now what can I learn from like high quality mapping or what can I learn from, um, it, you know, one of the things that we did was an artificial intelligence prediction system that used collar deer data to kind of learn those patterns um, and then generalize them. So they're not like a deer's pattern, but they're the general patterns. And then, um, it, it's funny cause my son and I were out just for dinner last night and uh, one of the guys on the pro staff had sent me like a hunting beast, I think it was hunting beast or something like that, where people are talking about the application sure. mm -hmm. and a lot of guys were like, I don't want some app telling me when I need to be in the field or when I don't need to be in the field. Um, and then to me, that's just obvious that they haven't looked at the application cause the application doesn't do that. It just kind of tells you on the targeting side from the military or from the uh, artificial intelligence prediction standpoint, it's just the animal is going to be generally in their core area during the day. And that doesn't mean hunt. Like a lot of the bucks that I hunt, I'm hunting in their core areas. I'm not, sure. I'm not ever going to wait to see them in that field where I have pictures of them at 1 a.m. I'm actually going to try to get in as close as I can. Yeah. Um, and I need to know when the wind is right and what the historical winds are in the area. And all of these things, these, uh, these, these, these variables, like I talked about before, I want to understand as many of them as possible. So, um, whether that was, you know, understanding with a terrorist um, in Afghanistan that they only traverse certain mountain passes during certain times of the year because they're snowed in and you can't do it that time of the year. So if you're trying to do an interdiction at, at, at a certain city or a certain village or something like that, um, it's not going to help for you to do it in January because they're not going to be traversing through this area. Um, th the same thing goes with like white-tailed deer. Um, uh, if you are going to be you know, and it, this varies across the U.S. And the one thing I've learned from running all of these things and then looking at the GPS data is that deer are not the same any, at any point. Across the nation, they're different. And the way that they are generally and generally what the machine can learn about deer and deer movement, it differs heavily based on where you are in the country. But, um, you know, hunting, uh, for instance, one of my favorite rut tactics is scrape hunting, um, identifying scrapes. Um, that's not a tactic that for the deer that I'm hunting would be particularly useful in the early season, unless you're on like a, 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 a massive community scrape that deer are working when they're, you know, um, uh, very comfortable and yep. secure cover in the early part of the season that might work there. But then I might be focused on some of these, like, uh, what I call competition scrapes or, or larger scrapes during the season that are getting worked by bucks or that are outside of doe bedding 
as they're kind of making their rounds. Those are, I, those, are, those are variables that people need to understand. And so what the application is trying to do and what I tried to do for military commanders was isolate those types of variables and make sure that the information was available so they could draw meaningful conclusions from that data and then make their own um, decisions. So when someone's like, I don't need a, an application to tell me when to hunt, it's like it's not telling you when to hunt, it's telling you what the general um, uh, consensus from an artificial intelligence standpoint on how deer could be acting during, during this yeah. time of the season, um, not whether or not you should hunt them or not. Sure. Um, especially if you're on public land, um, uh, you need to be in the bedrooms a lot of the time uh, yeah. during the day if you want you know, anything before 4 p.m. Uh, you might catch them on the way out, but you know, especially if they're pressured. So uh, that was one of the, you know, the things that, I, again, it's, it's all about understanding all of the things that, that contribute to deer movement um, and, then, and then putting them all inside of one application. For myself, especially when I was um, in the military and I didn't have time to develop applications, I was using something like six or seven different apps in order to piece everything together that informed me that the that the time was right for me to move in and try to harvest an animal, especially because my because my time was so um, limited. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would be looking at deer photos and be like, "All right, what wind was it when I saw this buck on this camera? What time of day was it? Um, you know, if I've got two years of photos, was it you know in the early season where he moved here more, or in the late season where he was here more? Um, what was the barometric pressure doing? What was the cloud cover like? Um, what were the food sources in the area? And all of these things, I would you know, distill into what it's, it's, it sounds, how can I put this? I'm using the terminology of a soldier because I was a soldier. Um, so sometimes it can sound kind of goofy when I'm saying like I would put together a target package for a particular buck, mm -hmm. but cause that is just the, it's the language that I use as I a soldier. I think it's soldier. fascinating personally. Yeah, um, like, but like this buck I would see in this field or working this scrape line when there was this type of wind, when there was this amount of cloud cover, when there was the, he didn't, he was rarely in this field when there were, when it was soybeans. I'd normally only see him when there was corn and then, okay, what does that tell me about the does or where are the largest doe groups? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then, and then I would, I wouldn't do target packages on individual does. And again, I know this sounds silly. So for people who are like rolling their eyes, I get it. Especially maybe military guys who are like, sure. oh, this guy's talking about target packages for deer right now. I know that can sound silly. Abstract away the military terminology and just say, uh, I'm going to formalize the way that I generate an understanding about a doe group. So this doe group was large in this, in this field when it was planted corn. But when there were soybeans, there weren't as many does there because there wasn't the cover available. So the does weren't in the corn as often. Or this corn wasn't left standing because the farmer wanted, um, this was feed corn. It would get left in the field longer. So that meant that there would be a larger doe group in that field. Mm -hmm. And then I only saw that 160-inch class buck whenever he knew there were 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 does bedded in this standing corn at any time. Right now I've got, a st I've got an understanding of that doe group. And I've got an understanding of how this buck focuses his time on to be as many around as many does and checking scrapes around large groups of does as possible. But then the years that were soybean, I would notice that I wouldn't see that buck as often on that field. Mm -hmm. And that was generally because there were less does. So I use the word target package. It's just like the terminology that I use. Yeah. You could also just say I diary and understand as many things as I can about the yeah. white tailed buck that this I'm targeting and then these does yep. and then distill all that information out. And then just make it um, uh, palatable for yourself so you can go back and reference it and then understand what the, um, uh, uh, the patterns or the, the, the uh, inclinations of these animals are. And then I use that as a soldier when I had almost no time or I had very little time to say, this is how I inform my hunts. So like one of the guys that we brought in early, I know you guys have talked to is Andy May. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like he and I had a very similar way of how we approached hunting was he's very, very meticulous as meticulous or more meticulous than I was like, he'd have like graph paper and sitting there and writing down everything he could. But then this guy would get out three times. Like he would have an area, a buck that he was focused on and he would have it done in three hunts Yeah, because he knew every, he had like a military guy or like a, a military intelligence guy or like an ODA guy or like a military commander. He had, recognized and isolated and accounted for every variable surrounding that buck in his habitat because he had other priorities like his family or his kids or whatever. Right. Um, and so, you know, people again will say something like, well, I don't need that much information from that, from the, an application or whatever. Um, it's like, that's fine. If that, yeah. if you don't have those time constraints or you don't have those things, um, 
then I would just say enjoy the simpler features of the, a of the application yes, and don't focus on the diary or the journaling or the seven years of historical imagery or the artificial intelligence or the historical wind stuff. Like, don't worry about that stuff. Just worry about getting out into the woods whenever you can. Just enjoy the high quality imagery and enjoy the, you know, the mapping and the, you know, the other stuff that's there and maybe not focus on those things. But that's always been my, um, uh, from a development standpoint with the application, I wanted an application that was simple and easy to understand for someone who just wanted to drop points on a map. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted you be, people to be able to dive as deep as they wanted sure. and, and really put together a lot of stuff and have it all centralized in one location so that they can make sense of their target environment. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm using military yeah. terms. Right. Make sense of the area that, where they were hunting yep. um, and, and, and put it all there. So, you know, a lot of guys will send me messages and, and, and also like I maybe went that way too early with the application because you know one of the first things I had introduced was um, uh, being able to switch maps with just your thumb yeah. on like by swiping the compass and then you had like a, a thing in there yep. uh, it was basically a little compass you'd swipe over it and you could change your maps um, when, when I was doing a lot of application development especially for military guys I always wanted people to be able to do what they wanted with the application with as minimal as, as minimal amount of interaction with the application as possible. Yep. So if you look at what it takes for you on other apps, um, in any, don't think hunting, think in anything, to get from like state A to state B, it might take you five clicks. Yeah. So I wanted to identify every state and make it one click or one click away. So like on the application, a lot of times I'll be on, I'll be on stand and I might have does near me or I might have a, a smaller buck or you know an animal I'm not trying to kill, but I wanna check something out. I could bring the app up. I could switch the side that that compass was on. I could get to my tools from that compass. I could get to my different maps from that compass. And then I could switch the side of the screen that that compass was on. Yep. And then it allowed me to do everything with one thumb. So if I'm just sitting there on, or um, if I, you know, <clears throat> for myself, I've fabricated on top of my um, bino harness, mm -hmm. my Vortex bino harness. Yep. Um, Excellent. I, I think I've shown you pictures or so I've shown someone pictures of it. It's just a flip down so that my phone is right here in front of me and I can interact with it. Um, and I can do it very quickly and be done. So if I'm sure. dragging a deer, if I'm carrying stands, or if I've got my kids with me and I'm carrying two stands or whatever I'm doing, it, I can get in, get out, get, and be quick. Whereas on some other apps, it's like, or if I'm in a new public spot where I haven't downloaded this or I haven't done this, I have to go out and fetch those layers. I have to host those layers and they have to be downloaded. And now they have to be stored for offline usage. And my th thing was like, I want public, as much public land data and private land data for all 50 states no tiered structures or anything like that. If you click the button, it's all there and it doesn't matter where you are, you're gonna be able to get to that data. It's just map, swipe, click, boom, done. Yep. Um, so the, the ease of that or the, the focus of that, uh, the ethos behind that was make everything easy and palatable. So if someone wants to just use it for mapping, like I said, they can, but if they wanna really get into the weeds, they can. Um, and they don't need a different app or a different version or step of the app or any of those things, it's all right there. Yeah. You know, um, it seems like, you know, like everything you talked about there, like it's really based around efficiency, yes. you know, from like you go to, you know, like previously, like you're, you're essentially m manually aggregating all this information from multiple sources, right? Yep. So you're pulling info from here, aggregating it yourself, then you're distilling it down to something that's, that's meaningful, right? Um, no easy task, yeah. you know, and then kind of, you know, moving that <clears throat> into the app where you're doing it, you know, all in one spot. It's kind of, you know, doing it for you, you know, it's doing a lot of that, that legwork for you as well as like you said, as far as like, even just from, I don't know, I mean, I always think like clicks are the enemy, right? When it yeah. comes to like the functionality of tech or yep. anything like that. And so being able to, I don't know, it makes sense to me. Yeah. 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 I mean, a lot of other things that are kind of under the hood that I don't talk about a lot is um, things that we have and things that we're doing in the future. You know, a simple one would be, I get a lot of messages about hey, I, I find this weather, the weather information and wind direction to always be super accurate no matter where I am or what I'm doing. A lot of yeah. guys message about that, but what I don't, you know, we could sell it more, but it's, to me, it's just the way it should be is like, we'll use three different weather services mm -hmm. and then identify where these weather services are accurate or not and then serve up that weather to people where those weather services are accurate. Sure. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, if AccuWeather or if um, Dark Sky or whatever works well in your location, and is accurate in location. In other words, forecasted versus what was observed and is actual actually yep. occurred, right? You need a neural network or you need some type of algorithm or system to go through and suss that out for all of the United States. Otherwise, right. you'd never be able to do it. So again, it's something that's simple. It's under the hood. You don't realize that it's happening, but it's another part of the application, which is something that I was doing for military guys back in the day is like, 
you know, there, there was a system that um, called ATAC, which was associate essentially. You can think of it as like a, a, a way to track your buddies when you're out in the field. Yeah. Um, and we're introducing parts of you know th the spirit of that system. We're introducing into Spartan Forge, um, but. If someone likes particular imagery in one area or something like that, we identify the imagery that works well in that, image, or in that area or the layers that people are using in that area, then we'll, we might serve that up first mm -hmm. whenever someone else is downloading the app for the first time. Again, so they don't have to do it. It's, it's all happening. So a lot of people don't realize, and I'm sure it's the same thing in optics, right? Like the, the best thing you can do with a high quality piece of kit is, is the people, people use the product and they don't even know the nice things that they have until they experience it somewhere else like, Oh, it doesn't have this or it doesn't have this, or I don't like the way that this glows. I don't like this. Or, you know, um, when you can introduce that type of experience, yep. um, and people don't even know it, it's like we, we, we have triple redundancy on our points. So when we were bringing uh, early on, we'd brought on, um, Levi Morgan mm -hmm. and he had had problems with two other apps where he, he has a ton of like, points first we don't constrict the amount of points that people can have on this on the system so you can have a hundred thousand points your map's going to load slowly but you'll have a hundred thousand points yep. um, but then we triple back them up so if you if you lose the point somehow i have three repositories of data that i can go to to re repopulate mm -hmm. your 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 um and it'll happen automatically in most cases um, sure. only if you've done something to your phone or rooted your phone in some way that it doesn't allow back done, done something with background data yep. would it be or if you have a virus in your phone or something like that yeah. that'd be the only way to do it um, okay. so the points never get lost now it's not something I need people to think about right it should be the standard for the industry but yep. it's not um, and I don't spend a lot of time talking about those things but maybe I should sure. <laughs> um, to, to, to illustrate the juxtaposition between what I'm trying to do and what other companies are trying to do but um, I think those things are important and people realize that the quality of it when they interact with it subconsciously. Yeah. I think yeah. like you said, like for the user, the end result is like, yeah, this is just super intuitive. This is how it should be. But like no easy task on the back end to make yeah. it that way. Like I'm even thinking of like, I can think of like some, some major websites that I've used and they actually made some pretty substantial changes. Yeah. But I didn't even notice that they really right, made exactly. the change exactly. because it was like so seamless. Then also, I was like, "Oh, that I'm actually doing this in a different way." Yeah. But it's so obvious that that's how we should be doing yeah. it that like I didn't notice. Yeah. I don't know if that it makes became sense. intuitive. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it, it, it's it's funny. A lot of the messages I get to is, and we've introduced it like on this next build. Like right now, to switch the maps, you have to swipe the compass. It's got to be done. On this next build, you'll be able to click the map the second time, and then it'll bring up all of your maps. Cool and then show them to you so you can maybe like the more traditional experience. But I think it's something like I did it. I was talking to my UI designer that I work closely with. Um, and I think it was something like 80% of the people who had been like, I really don't like swiping the maps. I, I, I wish I could click this, you know, um, and then interact with them that way. I'd be like, all right, cool. We're going to do that. Like that'll come or whatever. For now it's the swiping invariably like two or three months later, someone would, one of those guys would message me back and be like, I wouldn't use another app because I want to see what imagery was in that area. Yeah. And then I realized what it took to get to different maps or there weren't other maps that I could interact with. Sure. Um, and I, I really like doing it this way now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they really appreciated doing it that way. It just was either something they had to learn or they had to recognize um, where, you know, one of the problems I think we have is learning curve um, because we're doing things differently. Um, and a lot of the, the, the heuristic or not here, I shouldn't, uh, a lot of the things that I've developed inside of here are a result of the global war on terrorism and us needing to learn and change quickly over a long period of time. So I'm kind of giving the benefits of that to the hunter and the, and when they initially see it, they're just like, well, I didn't know that. So we try to put out like have Garrett and other guys put out videos where that kind of explains these things. And then once the learning curve is over, then they're like, oh, man, I can't believe this was ever done a different way. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah. But we, we will, like, you know, and I, and I learn because, you know, there's still 20% of people that like just clicking the maps, right? Um, and, and so we'll, we'll, we'll have that um, duality there where you can do either. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for the people that like being able to stick with the swiping, you know, I like the swiping. And it was on programs yeah. that I had developed in the military. Um, so that was one of the reasons yeah. why we went that way. Yeah. I think even people just being aware of the... Of that, you're like, 
you know, you're like, hey, we're in dev, like we're yeah. updating this a lot. Like it can be like annoying at first, maybe because like it's just change, right? Change, changes change, right? Yeah. Like it takes, you know, there's a learning curve or whatever, but like also there's benefits of it too. Yeah. That, like you're kind of getting the most rapid up to date, like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I have one one other question, kind of on the the targeting side, and, I, and yeah. Mark's got. His, I kind of got off the yeah. trail there. No, Sorry about that. It's, it's, I don't it's know. perfect. This is, this is the fun it's, stuff. Yeah, yeah, I like it. So, like you, when you come, we're we're talking about the targeting, you know, problem that you're trying to solve. So, let's say you've got you know bad guy X, and you know we need to plan a uh, uh, mission that's going to take this guy out. Mm-hmm. How long is your process for narrowing in on that guy or that or whatever that problem is that you're trying to solve what what kind of timeline are you typically working on with that well it's all dependent on the on the demands of the commander yeah. so commander can say like this guy needs to be dead by next month yeah so <laughs> that means i got 30 days yeah that's a that's a deadline right yeah yeah, yeah. It's a due or, date. yeah um or that work front or they have he's you know that would be like a tactical target and then we have what are called strategic targets um and there's a lot uh, many more layers of bureaucracy that go into the intelligence process that informs that targeting cycle. I've seen those ones take seven or eight years. Sure. Um, b- because it's, there's a lot of things that go into this. There's yeah. a ton of context. Um, but uh, essentially it could be, he's more useful alive for now, even though he's a bad guy. Sure. And there's things there that we can get from understanding him or maybe he's really sloppy with the way he uses his operational security yeah. and that informs for the rest of the bad guy cohort where they are and what they're doing because yeah. this guy's telling his girlfriend on you know whatever every time yeah. um so it, it it can what i'm trying to say is it's really what the commander says yeah. he wants done and when he wants it done is going to develop that is going to yeah. in, in, inform that targeting cycle if you said hey i really need hey bill we could just generalize this question and say if you had to take out person X, right, um, and uh, let's just talk about the general person, not somebody who's you know form, informed in tradecraft or knows how to do a surveillance detection route, just like a normal guy who's a thug or a thief or something yeah. like that, I'd say give me three months. Yeah. Um, and at the end of that three months, we'll know everything we need to know about this guy yeah. and be able, you know, with a high degree of accuracy, be able to do an interdiction or an elimination that will be because that's safe. That's the thing that I think was so fascinating when you and I chatted back in October is you kind of ch- talked through like, you know, I'm going to learn that this person does this on Thursday after night they're, or Thursday after work, they're grabbing drinks with their buddies. They go to this place when, uh, you know, the weather does this, they go home early so that they, you know, do this in the backyard to throw something in the shed, whatever. Yep, yep, yep. And I, I thought, I just think that from a surveillance standpoint is so fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, some of the things that you're talking about there is kind of pattern of life analysis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and the interesting thing about pattern of life analysis is until you have until you kind of step outside of yourself and, and or have like a buddy like me to look at what you do day to day, you realize that you do a lot of things not realizing that they hinge on other things. Like you just talked about, um, let's just say we're trying to do a pattern of life on Eric and it's like, you know, you might not know this, you might just do it, but you know, Eric runs outside when it's between 47 and 78 degrees. If it gets below 47, don't know why, but he likes the gym or he'll be running inside or he'll do some like hit cardio in his garage. If it's, uh, you know, 78 degrees or higher, hotter or whatever, it, again, it forces him inside. Yeah. When it's in between these places, generally 90% of the time, you'll see him running outside. Okay, when he runs outside, here is his pattern. You know, if it's a Tuesday or a Thursday, he doesn't run this route because there's a yoga crew right. that is at that park where he likes to warm up. So he doesn't use that park. So now yeah. he uses these parks. Um and when he runs that route at this park, he really likes this place here. And oh, by the way, there's, you know, screening cover and flow so he can get through the area easily. He's not seen while he's there because he's gained some pounds and he doesn't yeah. want to, you know, he's wearing a hoodie when he runs yeah. and he doesn't want to be seen because he's trying to lose weight or something right. like that. Like you learn all of these things about a person and then that person's not consciously thinking about all of those things, but nonetheless, they're reacting to their environment and they're making decisions based on that. Um, and then what, you know, a savvy intelligence person does is understands all of those things, isolates those variables and then understands what's driving them. And it's the same thing with a white tailed deer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's no different. 
Um, and so uh, the most efficient way to do that or the way that we started doing that towards the end of the global war on terrorism was using artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence um, has the ability to learn these patterns because a, a neural network is what we're using in our brains is a neural network. It is the same thing. It's just one is, is synthetic and one is organic. Um, but all of those patterns, uh, the, the neural network picks up on them. It doesn't know what they're for. Or it doesn't, it, it's not informed. Yep. It's not being told. It doesn't care necessarily. It's just trying to get that pattern as accurate as possible. So when you try to talk about someone, um, and you can think about it this way. You, we have these other, you know, other people have tried learning or predicting animal human movement behavior using what are called expert models. An expert model might work, might, and generally it doesn't, but it, you might, if you really have a wise person, they might be able to generate an expert model on a particular animal. So like a particular deer or something like that. But nine times out of 10, like I've talked to guys who have hunted deer that are wearing the GPS collars where I'm looking at the data. And when you ask them to tell you what they think is going on with these deer, and then you do a juxtaposition, and you actually look at what these deer are doing, the nine times out of 10, they're always way so far off, you wouldn't yeah. believe it. Yeah. Like they just have like one slice of the pie that is a repeatable circumstance that they tether themselves to, yeah. and then they hinge, they hinge uh, success yeah. on that just little bit of the pie and it can work for people like that sure. can work and it does work for people. Um, what a neural network is doing is it's understanding you're, you're feeding it every variable that every, every ingredient that constitutes the pie and then deriving every pattern from that. And it's not something a human can do. Um, it's just impossible. And there's, we come to the table with too much bias um, because we know things that have worked for us. So someone might say something like, you know, I only hunt the leeward side of a ridge. Um, I know from looking at collar GPS data that deer very, uh, are maybe 20% of the time they're on a leeward ridge. Um, there's more bottom activity than a lot of people um, understand, like in the bottoms. But you can't hunt a deer in a bottom, or it's very difficult, or you need a precise wind, and you only need to be in there during a time when thermals are rising or there's a creek there to pull your thermals out. Yep. And you only know that because you went down there and you're meticulous with some milkweed and you understood the thermal pull in, rel in, in, in relation to where these deer are bedding. So now you're doing that homework, right? Um, and, and, and you're putting together, again, a, a target profile for how this animal might act in this bottom. And then you move in and do that, right? Well, someone might say something in opposition to that. It's like, I only hunt deer in the top third of a ridge, right? Or something like that. But, but what they don't realize is that deer aren't bedding all the time in this top third. Like you, you can't, there's so many hunting personalities who are like deer bed in the top third of these sure. rid, leeward ridges. Right. And then I'll look at the GPS data and that's not the case at all. Yeah. It's just that sometimes they are, but w what's happened is, is that they've developed their own individual, individual heuristic or good enough way. Uh, heuristics like a good enough way to get something done mm -hmm. because it's actually easier for them to get into those deer when when they're in that top third because they because the thermals are more predictable and because the leeward wind now they're getting in there and they're catching it they're able to catch a deer because the deer also and i'm not saying it doesn't work it works yeah. <clears throat> but now the deer is susceptible and they're and the person's in there and they kill that deer and then they think oh well this is the only way to hunt deer yeah but what they don't realize is all of those days that they hunted that area, they could have been educating that deer or that deer was in the bottom or whatever. And they just got it done that one time. Because a lot of times I will, you know, talk to or reach out to either academics or their students that hunted the areas where these collared GPS deer are. Now, now they're not hunting these deer with tacit knowledge of where the deer are. They're just allowed to hunt these areas because they got permission from the landowners. So they're in there and then they'll kind of say, well, this is what I think about these deer and this is what they're doing and this is what they do. And it's never right. It's yeah. just never right. Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm ever right either. You just have to do what works for you. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying people are all dumb and need to figure out deer. It's like, no, it, you're, you're still probably, if you stick to that top third leeward, leeward um, uh, profile, like that's the thing that you want to do, you're going to kill deer. Yeah. And you're going to find deer. So. And they're going to be up there. It's just they're not always up there. Right. Um, yeah. they're, in fact, that's not the case most of the time. It's just that's where you were able to harvest them. So now you've built yourself a preconceived bias yeah. about that. And it's the same thing with targeting. It's the same thing with surveillance and stuff like For that. Sure. Um, is 
uh, not understanding kind of the second, third, or unconscious uh, implications that a person's using when they when they move from point A to point B. Like a savvy observer might be like, it's because of this or this or this. Meanwhile, it's ten or fifteen other you know er- yeah. reasons why this thing is actually happening. But again, it's a good enough it's a good enough system because it's worked for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, again, I'm not trying to like crap on people sure. or, or say these, I'm not, all I'm saying is if you looked at the GPS data and the amount of GPS data that I have access to, which is, you know, a lot of data. And it's one of my favorite things to do is just go through and watch deer and how they yeah. move. You would see that they don't obey that. They have not been told that that's the way they're supposed to move yeah. and they don't move that way. Yeah. It's just that's when these people have been successful. So I feel like I'm hammering home something and I'm, uh, I guess what, what, what can a use a hunter use with that is do more investigation than just these things that you're hearing from certain personalities and try to get a complete understanding of where you're going, especially if your time is, is limited. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, because that more and more that's the case is everyone's got everything else going on in their life when they just rather be in a tree stand. Um, but they can't because of family commitments or whatever that they got going on when you have the time to do that scouting like don't don't uh um what is the old kung fu movies i used to watch when i was a kid it's like don't limit yourself to one style yeah. like try to learn them all yeah. um a little bit of each so that when you you know find that 180 inch deer that isn't isn't hasn't read the rubric of deer movement right. that you think that they have and you want to take that deer out yep. you know try to remove yourself from the situation and try to understand everything that might be informing that deer's movements. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and that's what we're doing with the company and, 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 and trying to uh, help inform hunters when they use the application. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it just seems like, you know, you're, you know, analyzing so many data points, right. That, yeah. that can provide, you know, information is power. Right? Yeah. So you like, absolutely. you just have more information versus, you know, like you, like you said, you might have some trail cams, you might have some, some in the field, anecdotal things that have worked in the past, you know, and, and they're definitely working for yeah. a reason, Yeah. but, uh, having, uh, you know, and I guess it could work in reverse too. Like you might have information that, yeah, deer are doing this, but the reason why they're doing that is, is because they're not vulnerable right, in exactly. that area. Precisely. So like y- yeah. you still may want to stay away there, but you might be like, Hey, it's crunch time. Instead of being like, you know, locked into, well, this is my tactic. It's like, it's crunch time. I got one more day. Guess what? I'm going to roll the dice and I'm going to go in tight. Yep. And we're either going to kill them or we're not. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Right. Um, it's all fascinating. That, yeah. that And that's that's what I think is so unique too is there's, you can't be a one trick pony. Yeah. You know, like I, I know I fall into that a lot where it's like, you know, hey, this has worked in the past. So okay, people get conditioned to do that same thing again and expect the same result. But then all of a sudden you you go out there, whatever, example, you bump into, you know, the buck that you're after that day. In a pl- you hear this all the time. Like someone is hunting this deer. Gosh, I forget who, who this was. I was talking to somebody that was hunting this specific deer, um, and they basically took a day off of hunting them and went in a totally different area to, to give it a rest. And sure enough, there's that buck and they kill it, you know? And I think that is a perfect example of kind of what you're talking about. Like, yeah, you think, you know, as, as a deer hunter, you think you're in the game, you think you're in this spot because it's worked, you have some intel. Yeah. That's one little sliver of the pie, but there is so much additional data out there that when you really tap into, you know, you can use to your advantage. I I, I laugh too, because one of the other things I've, I've seen is it doesn't take much data for people to to, to, to develop a self-imposed uh, understanding of what deer are doing, um, where, where somebody could bump a deer into you twice, <laughs> like you're hunting some public land and you chose to sit like a spot yeah. and then someone bumps a deer and it, now it's under your stand and you've put an arrow through it. Mm-hmm. That happens twice. And if somebody was coming to that tree stand with an idea of what they thought they knew about deer movement, yeah. that's their method for the rest of their lives. Exactly. <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? It's like, well, I sat this tree and I was at this elevation and I did it on this wind because I thought he was down here and it, I killed 260 inch deer with it. Yeah. It's like, well, or, right. <laughs> yeah. you know, this is what happened, you know? It, and, exactly. And so all I'm trying to say is. Bill, uh, you're, you're, you're rocking, you're rocking my strat deer strategies <laughs> yeah. to, their, to their very core <laughs> yeah. right yep. now. Like the, the foundation of every decision I make is crumbling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Well, and I'm not saying people shouldn't have these things and they shouldn't do them. All I'm saying is, um, 
if you find yourself hanging up or not getting on the deer that you want to get on or whatever, for whatever reason, um, you know, it's an insane man that does the same thing over and over again, expects a different result. Um, and, and a lot of times it just takes a conversation with a buddy and kind of remove yourself and then objectively take a look at what's been happening. Yeah. And this applies everywhere in life, not just with deer hunting, you know what I'm saying? Yep. Uh, is get, you know, uh, uh, try to find uh, another useful thing that I do is talk to people with opposite opinions of what your opinion is on a specific subject. And again, it translates everywhere in life, but I use it in deer hunting. I use it in soldiering. I use it in development. I use it in everywheres. And a lot of times some of my best People who don't, I, I, know, I don't get along with are a lot of times, especially in the military, are the people I would go to. Because a lot of times, and I'm not trying to get all like Freudian here, but generally when you have a visceral or instinctive response to someone and you don't like someone um, and you can't put your finger on it, it's generally because they're doing something that you won't wish you were doing <laughs> or, yeah. or there's something about them that is making you automatically reject them rather than understanding that they probably know something you don't. Right. So I would try to go to those people and pick their brains um, and it's the same thing as like a pissed off customer. Yeah. Like when someone messages me and they're like, they just don't like the app and they might just totally unload on me yeah. or say something or didn't do this or that or anything. I'm like, look, dude, I'll give you a subscription for two years. If you just write me like a two page paper on like what you hate about this so that I can understand it. Sometimes it's just petty, petulant, like whatever. But then sometimes there are these nuggets of stuff that I can pull out of there. Then I use those to further my development. Um, and, and I find that to be especially useful in deer hunting as well. Like I've got buddies that have different methods than I'm a November scrape hunter. Like I've always done that. It's something that's been successful for me. There's probably better ways to hunt, yeah. but it's what I do. And then when I'm not successful, then I might call a buddy up and, you know, I, my buddy Johnny or someone like that, Johnny Stewart, yeah. um, who is, you know, should be 15 times bigger than he is. I've like some guys, I don't understand why they're not like the, monk on the top of a mountain that people should have to go to yeah. and get one question and then have to come back down the mountain. Andy Mays, one of those guys. I don't understand why I'll look at some personalities and be like, this guy's massive and I'm not sure I would trust him with a staple gun. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then there's this guy over here, like a guy like an Andy or a Johnny Stewart or something yeah. like that, who, who has this like what I call transfer intelligence, like no matter where you put them, so kind of like that old saying, like a Rambo type of guy, drop him in the middle of the jungle, he'll come out running the tribe with all the meat and all the women. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter where you put them. These guys are like that. Like Andy's one of those guys, Johnny's one of those guys. It doesn't matter where you put them. They're just yeah. going to figure it out. Um, and I'll often go to those types of guys because they don't hunt the same way that I do. Sure. Um, and then they'll help me break down, you know, yeah. this is how you've gotten your head stuck in the sand. Yeah. So I think that's useful in every capacity. Yeah to be able to do that. But what it takes is for a lot of times, and it's tough for us as hunters, is that takes a lot of ego death. Right. It's like you have to <laughs> first deal with this. The biggest thing that this company's taught me about hunting is I don't know anything about hunting. Right. Is that's the, that is the biggest, like people ask me the biggest thing that I've yeah. learned is I don't know anything. Yeah. That is the God honest truth. <laughs> and it's made me a better hunter and a right. better person to understand that and be at peace with that. Sure. I think that's tougher, especially when we're younger. Um, yep. if you, you know, I thought I knew it all about hunting when I was 26. Yeah. I thought I had it figured out. Right. I, along with life generally, I would say yeah. at that time, which yeah. is not the case. Yeah. Um, I've only learned as I've gotten older that I don't know anything. Right. Uh, I think it was, uh, the E fours in ancient Greece or something along those lines said that Plato was the smartest guy in the Republic because he knew he didn't knew any, know anything. Sure. Right. It, you know, that's, that's wisdom. So, yeah. you know, being able to do that and humble yourself and have that ego dissolution, then go ask a buddy and figure things out and not rely on the gurus, um, to get these things done. And gurus have their place. Don't get me yeah. wrong. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and, and they're often very successful. Um, but I just think that a lot can be learned by just trying to ingest and, and process and think about every piece of information you can surrounding a particular idea or, 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 or target or whatever you want to get done. Yeah. 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 I mean, and you, I mean, you got to trust your gut. I mean, you, I mean, there's a re you have experiences, you base, you base decisions on those experiences. I mean, that is extremely important data or that type of data is extremely important, but you also have to trust the data that like, yeah. that, like you couldn't, that you couldn't get on your own. Absolutely. You know, and I think it's just like you said, you got to keep an open open mind. If, if you're a hunter and you right. think you don't have something to learn, like, I mean, that's my favorite thing about podcasting is get to pick the brain exactly of, you know and we're even at work we're just always bouncing stuff off of each yeah. other just like okay what do you think about that like i said i, I experienced this and you know we might have 
you know, both like, oh, we love November and we kill all our bucks in November. Yep. We might be doing it a wildly different way. Exactly. You know, yeah. so there's just there's just more than one way to skin a yeah, cat. For sure. I, I was curious, you know, we're talking about, you know, data, data points, variables, like how many variables like are you stacking, I guess, and then what how do you determine if it if a variable is um relevant? The machine. So but right now we're using, I think the last time I looked, it was 22 okay. variables go into the neural network in addition to variables that you would think about, like um, wind direction or uh, obviously the collar deer input. Um, but basically how we use that now is we insert all of this data in. And if the, if the feature doesn't correlate with movement, then it doesn't get used. So in other words, um, you, you could think about it this way a lot of people abide by moon data for whatever reason. Sure. Now this goes back to preconceived notions. I was actually, that's one of my questions I was going to say is, uh, is moon phase a variable you account for? Well, let's talk about it because yeah. here's the first thing I'll tell you is I don't know. Right. What I can tell you is the machine doesn't use it as a variable. Uh -huh. It's not, it's not uh, correlated. Correlation A is not causation, but it's not correlated with deer movement. In other words, right. when the machine's trying to make now, um, there, there are studies where um, it's, again, correlation is not causation, but there are studies that I've seen, and I actually have data from some of them, that deer may move more in their core areas during moon overhead, moon underfoot, which I haven't seen that, all right? And, and when I examine the study, I'm not looking at the data in the same way that maybe these academics are when they're drawing these conclusions. So, again, I, I don't know. What I can tell you is the machine... Um, racks and stacks it very low in the um, I, when you consider everything that goes in it's considered very low in the uh, pecking order and I'm not even sure if we use it right now because um, as we get more data we always have to go back and then retrain the models and look at all of the data to make sure that there's if something wasn't being wasn't predicting before a good example is humidity humidity used to be very low until I got more southern deer data humidity um, factors a lot into southern deer movement um, whereas it almost has no impact on like deer up here or in, or in the Northeast where, sure. where they're focused on food and cover um, and, and the day-to-day. -day, uh, again, the amount of favorable feeding days in the North is one of the biggest indicators of movement uh, when, it, when you're approaching a, mo uh, a, um, a weather front. In other words, if a buck has a ton of fat on his body and there's a weather front moving in, the majority of mature deer will spend that first weather front and that first weather event on their stomach. Whereas most hunters might be like, I've killed my biggest deer on the t front end or the tail end of a storm, so I'm going to get out there. Well, how many favorable feeding days are there and how much fat do we think is on that deer? And, and is he going to risk his neck to feed as it responds to this pressure drop that they can sense? Back to the moon data. Um, the, the moon data, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't see a ton of information to suggest that there's a ton to do with moon data, but a lot of people I, that I've talked to about this, and I interact with everyone in our Instagram, especially when it comes to like deer questions. I'll spend my first two hours in the morning, you know, I'll wake up, get on my, get on the machines, start answering questions, t tickets, troubleshoot, but then deer questions, and I'll spend, usually I'll have three or four a morning, um, and I'll answer questions about deer movement. Um, someone will say something along the lines about asking about like red moon or moon overhead, moon underfoot. And, and then I'll answer them and they'll be like, well, BS, I've killed my biggest deer on blah, 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 blah. It's like, okay, let's think about this. Like, let's, I don't do this in the messaging. I just say, all right, man, just like use what works for you. I don't know why you asked me that question. <laughs> like you just wanted me to reinforce your bias. Yeah, then yeah. just tell me you want me to do that and I'll do it for you. Well, then but the if you want what the data is saying, I can tell you what the data is saying. Yeah. And then, so, but then, what, I, what if I were to sit face to face with these people and I could actually have a dialogue with them, I'd say, okay, so what did you do that made that, that allowed this red moon to help you kill this deer? Uh, well, I waited for the red moon and I didn't hunt that area until I knew the time was right. Okay. So you had access to a piece of land where the, you didn't molest or bother the deer whatsoever. And they started feeling pretty comfortable in that environment and maybe moved more during daylight hours than they normally would because you've left them alone. Yep. And then you, and then you, not only did you see that that red moon was coming, but then you were like, here's going to be the weather on that day. Here's, here's gonna, how I have to get into that stand because it's my one shot at this red moon. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be super specific about how I get in. I'm going to be as quiet as possible because I don't want to ruin this opportunity of this red moon. I don't want to clank something together. I'm going to get up that tree slowly and as quietly as possible. And it's like, 
okay, now <laughs> we've introduced something totally different totally. is you have un left those deer alone. And yep. because you had this presupposition about a red moon, you were as slow and as stealthy and exactly. as quiet as you could be. And you didn't even have your phone on vibrate. Right. Like you, you did not want to spoil this opportunity. Right. And then you got up that tree and you killed that buck. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then use that red moon. It will work for you. Yeah. Right. Like if you're going to work the for rest you, of if you're going to follow the rest of that format and you do that every time, it's yeah. going to work for you, brother, like every, or sister, every time. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, like potentially you go back to like correlation is not causation. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and if I hunt a hundred percent red moons, I'm going to kill a hundred percent of my deer on, yeah. on a red, red moon. On red moons. Yeah. Exactly. If, I, if I like this spinner and I throw this spinner a hundred percent of the time, by God, I'm going to catch a hundred percent of my exactly. steelhead on that spinner. Yeah, you know? for sure. Exactly. hundred percent. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that might be like a little uh, uh, extreme, but you know, like, you know, I mean, well, it's, and like, I, it's like, it's good to look at all the stuff, but at the end of the day, oftentimes like I can hunt the days that I hunt. Right. Yeah. So it's like, use the information that you have to hunt that yeah. day to the best of your ability. And yeah. I think with some of the predictive stuff that at least from what I've seen, it's like, okay, well this might be, um, you know, a high core area activity yeah. day. So it's like, oh, oh, cripes, you know? Well, then I can decide, number one, do I want to roll the dice? Do yeah. I want to go into that core? Or yeah. do I want to wait when there might be, like, more, you full know? Full range. Full range yeah. activity yeah. or, yeah. you know, broader spectrum where I can be a little bit more gentle with the spot or... Yeah, but exactly. Again, it's just like and that's the way I would use it. And that's the way I use the, the AI is, you know, moving in there. But then, again, like, I, I try to be balanced in everything. I used to think humidity had nothing to do with deer movement, especially when I had like more nor northeastern and midwestern and like Saskatchewan, Manitoba data. Yep. Um, but then as I started getting data from the south, humidity went boom, 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 boom up, especially to where it's one of the top predictors for deer movement in like the south, especially in humid areas. Um, so I might have ran into an old timer who knew that and was like, hey, Mr. Machine Learning guy, I know deer move more under humid hum, this one of the humidities here versus here yep. and I, I know that to be true because that's how my grandfather hunted it's how my father hunted it's how i've hunted my grandson's hunt and we've been predictive and i might have been like well sir you know i don't see a ton of correlation with that like sure. that's not very high and then i get a bunch of data and now it's gone higher and now mm -hmm. we've got a pretty good swath of data from across the u.s so i have a better general understanding now but again at that time could have been a flipping guy and been like yeah. Yeah. uh Hey, sir, I'm sorry. Right. You know, these are collar GPS deer, yeah. you know? Yeah. So again, like th it goes back to your point. The, the par part I was trying to illustrate there is you should go with your gut because your gut might have told you in Southern Alabama that humidity drives deer movement yeah. and, you know, forget what the, what Bill Thompson is saying. I know what deer drive deer down here sure. and you might know something that I don't and I expect that you do. So also trust your gut and yeah. trust your senses. Can you segment out? the information kind of like regionally yes yeah, so and, and we do yep. yeah yeah absolutely so like yeah but like you said like something might be super meaningful for somebody in the south that you know isn't for somebody yep. in the yeah. northeast so th that that's really cool yeah um wh when did you when like when did you like mentally where you're like oh man i can use like um all all of my military background and surveillance and you know ai and stuff when were you like oh i think i can use this to hunt deer or, or create an app to hunt deer. It actually or took me to, a long... Uh, to assist or, you know... Sure. Yeah, yeah. It actually took me a long time to put that together. And I, I was almost shameful. I've been doing the work and been a hunter for like 10 years before I was like, mm -hmm. oh, there's a parallel here. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing when you think about it, right? Like most people might have been like a couple of weeks into targeting and been like, yeah. huh, I could use this for deer. But like it, the actual like ep epiphany didn't hit me. I was in Afghanistan at the time and I think I'd been like in a commander's update briefing or something and I was going back to my outpost and I was missing the whitetail rut and I was like, oh, yeah. wish I was home right now. Like, it's, yeah. <laughs> again, being like 26 or 27, I should have been thinking about wanting to be with my family. I should have yeah. been thinking about, you know, wanting to not be in an active war zone. Yeah. But my thought was I'm, you know, it's November 5th right now and I wish I was on a tree. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of things we should do. Yeah, we should do, right? Yeah. And uh, so I was just on the side of a mountain with another buddy of mine. And we, he was a, he was a, was he a whitetail hunter? Or maybe he was a mule deer hunter. It doesn't matter. And we started thinking about it. And then I, it kind of just clicked with me. And I was like, huh. A lot of this, there's a lot of parallels here and I should do something about this. And I'd started talking to buddies about it and it just, at that point then kind of like the scales had fallen from my eyes. And now I started, I, I started to see everything 
in that way. And every time I was doing something or building a capability yeah. or, you know, in all of the work that I was doing, I was always thinking, how can I translate this to deer hunting? And then I just started keeping a journal. And every time I did it, I wrote something down. Mm-hmm. Um, and that deer journal, I had gone through one and a half of them um, by the time I had retired from the military. And I started building this stuff about two years, three years ago, seriously. But I'd started collecting the information about seven years ago. So, um, like we, you know, keep like a backlog in Jira of all of the things that we want to build. We have like three and a half years of sustained, like wow. that we've mapped out of stuff that we want to build and incorporate. Yeah. Um, and the biggest problem is just racking and stacking it and trying to find out kind of what the market wants first yeah. and like what the hunters want, which is why we have, I think such a great pro staff is, you know, we meet once a week and we talk about these things like. Yeah. what's going to be most important or we'll have like we had our spartan forge retreat in west virginia um up near pennsylvania this year and getting everyone in the room to kind of to kind of go back and forth about you know what's mo- more important on the development yeah. pipeline what are we going to be doing what you know what what do we think hunters want sure. right now that's important and that's kind of how we rack and stack that um but we've got stuff that we're going to be building until yeah. i don't know when Let's talk about some of that because I think what the plan is with the, this podcast is to launch it after you have some stuff that you're working on now. Yeah. Um, after that is out there. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, you know, I started kind of, um, I used to state dates and things yeah. that I was releasing things, and that's just a horrible idea. So, I can tell you that our goal is to get these things out before the hunting season. Some of yeah. them were testing, they've already been developed, but, you know, you find out in te- a lot of times in development, you'll be like, well, this capability that you've made works great on three devices but it doesn't work great on these other two and it's like okay well we can't put this out in the market because those other two devices constitute 40 percent of the market yeah so we need to fix this you know this isn't one or two guys when the phones are going to have these problems there's a lot right. of guys so what i i preface this conversation to say we can discover those things and that makes my timeline elongate and so people will ask me when is this coming out when is this coming out and i've kind of stopped saying dates because i've never been sure. right about a date but we, we have two um, uh, major kind of capabilities that are coming out next. And the first one's called Blue Force Tracker. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we've been developing it for quite a while. Um, and like I said, there are a lot of dependencies that we've learned along the way in order to nail something like this down. But we're about 90% of the way there. Uh, what Blue Force Tracker is essentially going to be able to do is whether, you know, I have a group of buddies that I hunt in Western Maryland with on the same large piece of public um, tens of thousands of acres. Um, there's, st- I'm still learning new places and finding places that I've never seen before there. And, um, we constantly were sharing points and stuff like that between each other. So the first instantiation of the, the release will be the three of us can add ourselves either to like a same lease, pl- lease land that we're on together or the same public land that we are together. And anytime a point is made inside of there, um, it'll get shared among the group. Um, the person who runs the group, the person who runs the group can restrict certain points if they want to. Um, but generally if the three of us are hunting the same area and we want to share points and we add our emails to this, to the blue force tracker. And then inside of this area where you've drawn like a polygon, it'll share points. And then if you have service, you can elect to live share your location. So if you are in there and you know, you fall from a tree stand or yep. you need help carrying a deer or, um, you're injured somehow, as long as you have service, It'll show either where you were last or where you are in real time if you have service. This is like a safety thing. Yeah. Or if you hunt with like your wife or you hunt yeah. with your buddies or your son or whatever, yep. um, and you know there's service in there, it can be really useful for that. And the other thing is, you know, some people don't like the tactic. I've only done it once or twice. I had fun when I was doing it, but on deer drives, yeah. it can be super useful. I was going to say that sounds like deer. I was just about to say that sounds like some next level deer drives. Yeah, yeah. Well, also from a safety perspective, just yeah. be, like, knowing yeah. that your buddy is coming down this draw. You know, and, 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 and just having that realization um, is, is super uh, useful to make sure, you know, I, I grew up with a friend actually in a small town in northeastern North Dakota whose dad was killed in a hunting accident, mm-hmm. shot in a hunting accident. Um, I hope that some of these capabilities will, yeah. if I get a story about like one guy, like I was, I thought he was a deer and I looked at the app and it wasn't a deer, it was a yeah. person and I didn't shoot my uncle, yeah. you know, yeah. now first off, you know, have target awareness, understand your, yeah. you know, don't point your weapon at something you don't intend to destroy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, but I'm glad that it helped in that, yeah. in that, you know, that for me would make the whole release totally. worth it. You know what I'm saying? Um, well, and, and you never want to shoot in an unsafe direction, but I know that I've even just had like an inkling, like an inkling of 
a question mark in my mind and I've not shot at deer before right. because of that. Yeah. And I guess to be like, okay, you know, I'm 95% sure that this is a safe shot, but I'm only 95% sure and it ain't worth killing a man. Right. right? Exactly. Or whoever, no you know. Right. Um, but to be able to go like, okay, I feel like that and look down and go, yeah, we're good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, totally. I think it just, that totally gives peace you some, of mind. some peace of mind yep. there. And as far as learning from that, you know, I don't, I do deer drives about once a year, you know, but also to be able to conduct a drive or even just, um, you know, move through the terrain, know where people went through the terrain yeah. and then cross ref that with what people saw, yeah. potentially do it a different way the next time yeah. and cross ref that you might be like, oh, I didn't think the deer exactly. were going to be betting here, but I guess they are betting here, sure. you know, or, or if I come through here, they actually exit this way. That's what we want to do. I don't know. Sure. Well, yeah. the, a couple of other things that you'll be able to do is not only will it share points, but you'll be able to draw lines. So you'll be able to get into an area and say, you know, I want you walking on this line, staying on this ridge, oh. and you draw the line. And then I want him here and him here. And then our goal is everyone meets here at this time. Sure. So you can coordinate all of that through an interactive um, graphical user interface that is, is, is centralized and everyone has. Re and then what we'll do later, not right away, um, but soon after the release, you'll be able to draw like basically, um, what, what are we calling them? I can't remember the term. We came up with a cool term and I can't remember what it is, but it's basically essentially a gateway um, that you'll be able to draw for other users. And if you deviate from the gateway, the phone will just start vibrating so you'll say like hey i want you walking this ridge or i want you maybe the ridge isn't obvious maybe you're in like minnesota or something and it's like i just want you on this ridge and you know say you're guiding your son right so your son might not know topo maps as well as he should or whatever he's 13 or he's not paying attention or whatever yeah. it's just like i want an alert if he leaves this this bounding box or this directed area of travel that I've wanted him yeah. on. And then he'll get an alert and then you'll get an alert. And then you can just like call him be like, Hey, you know, you're off this, you're off. You're not, you're not on. That's really Man, cool. My dad would have loved that when I was 14, 15 years <laughs> old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and that's so like, you know, I'm thinking about even just navigating in the dark. Like maybe you're trying to get in, maybe you're trying to get out of somewhere, Yeah. And, you know, and you got maybe, you know, hopefully you remembered your headlamp. I know I haven't sometimes. And he, you're like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm on this ridge. Well, actually, you've taken some finger ridge that's yeah. like yeah. looping you around. You're completely off yeah. track. Yeah, exactly. Totally. You know, now, all of a sudden, you're lost Yep. in the dark. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, safety is the main. Yeah. Sharing pins and being able to see where your buddies are and having fun like that is great, whatever. Um, really, it's a safety thing is the piece that we're developing there. Um, then the next kind of one that I'm super proud of. And again, it's kind of one of those things where there's a lot more under the hood than maybe what the users are seeing, but it's just a graphical user interface that um, uh, shows wind direction. Um, and we've used a lot of, you know, kind of stuff that under the hood again, that we've done with wind in the way that we look at wind and the way the services that we use to generate these wind vectors or the directions that the wind are going. And it'll just be like a wind overface and it'll, or overlay that'll be the first of like mini weather interaction things that you can do inside of the app. Um, those are like the two major things um, before the season and then probably as the season starts um, we will have some of these what I call wear features which are just like interesting areas you should go scout yeah. um, and highlight in the map and the AI will kind of just pop these things out to you and the, again for the people who are like you know people are becoming too reliant on technology or whatever again the market the people that I'm looking after or looking for here are people that have limited amount of times of time um they, they want to hunt they want to get out there they want to enjoy the outdoors um but they don't have time to to to, to pour over you know yep. 70 hours of maps to look in an area and maybe find some stuff and it just will help them by kind of giving them a step up but then also um you know children are using phones all the time now and you know my son is sitting right over here on a phone right now um and then so if you can educate them about hunting or help them on their education, you know, timeline in hunting and then show them something inside of an application and kind of explain things then, but then also kind of give them the self empowerment of understanding things on their own. And maybe they don't like listening to their dad or, yeah. you know, <laughs> or being told what to do, but they can pick up a phone and kind of learn a couple of things yeah. and, and about deer hunting. And then that kind of maybe greases the skids on getting them into the sport. Um, it's for those people as well. And then it's also for people who are like, you know, I wasn't supposed to have Thursday off. 
I'm out here on a company retreat and there's some public land near me and I just want to take a quick look and go scout some areas or maybe do a hang and hunt sure. in the afternoon, you know, that type of thing. But then also it's, uh, f you know, for the very experienced hunter, it's just, I want to see all the leeward fingers on this public land and highlight them for me. Um, because I want to be quick about this and I want to get out there and look at these things and yeah. th th for their own reasons They can go up there and do that. So those wear features will be coming out incrementally throughout the season, but um, You know, I we had started training these things and doing these a couple of years ago um, They pre proved to be a little bit more difficult, but we've nailed them now now and those things will be coming out here Very cool. This year, hopefully yeah. um, so uh, and then other just a lot of um, Cleaning up of the app, um, you know, it's only about nine months old um, you know, a lot of the applications that were out, are out there have been out there for many years. They're, you know, they're primarily there's five of us working on this. Um, you know, a lot of development crew, crews on, on apps that are like this, maybe 30, 40, 50 guys yeah. um, or gals. And so, uh, you know, we are, are very Spartan. <laughs> Yeah. In, in our makeup and that it, there's nothing superfluous that's it's 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 locked down we know what we want to do we all agree on the way to get there and we've architected these things out for many years yeah. so you know we know where we're going we knew a lot of times what happens in software development is someone will architect the back end or like the the processing side of an application the servers um, and they'll architect it in a way to 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 meet um, a particular feature that they want to have present in the application um, and then two years pass and now they want a different feature and now they have to re-architect their back end and they have to remake up the way that data gets shared whether it's like a graph query language or a call or something like that where um, the data is uh, the system is not set up to share data in the way that you want to make this feature well we knew we know every feature we want to build for the next few years so we took all of the time to architect that back end and make sure all of the data is structured in a way that will allow us to do all of these things go forward so we don't have to go back and you know oh crap I, I wish I had had a four by four and I bought this two by four truck um, and now I either need to go buy a new one or I need to go, you know, do something to my truck. Um, we've, we've built the system to sustain all of those things, which will make our releases, our product releases and our uh, development pipeline, pipeline and our feature set um, to be much more streamlined and quicker. And you'll see, you know, we've done two pretty big releases already um, since the app initially dropped um, that I think make it a totally, it's a totally different experience now than it was when it first came out. So we're going to keep going down that road that's awesome. super cool so yeah i mean we've talked a lot about you know almost like the predictive behavior yep and and some of the new stuff with the app but that like you know for those who you know i know we've been talking about it for an hour but like for those like the baseline functionality so you kind of have the predictive behavior you've got mapping yep historical uh, weather journaling okay so one of the cool things i think a guy and again andy worked with me pretty tightly on this was in this journal feature um, you can use it two ways you're either in the field and you see some maybe you see a two and a half year old three and a half year old deer that has some potential yeah. and you want to get back after it in a couple of years you can make a journal entry you can take pictures of the deer it'll note the weather when you saw the deer it'll note the wet, the wind direction all of those things and then it'll catalog it as a journal entry uh, oh, but then okay. also maybe you've got some pictures um, and we're going to streamline this in the future you'll be able to auto ingest photos and they'll be able to be cool. auto made into um uh, journal entries, but maybe you've got some pictures of a deer you're tracking. You can you can look up the time of the photo. You can take a photo of the photo, put it in your journal entry, and then you can back um, program what the time and the date was of the photo, and then it'll pull all of that um, weather information and then store it as a journal entry. So, so again, you can do that kind of that's cool uh, metadata mm -hmm. analysis of, that's that, really of the cool. photos. That was gonna that was one of my big questions as far as like y you know you've done you've got the the collared deer data and mm -hmm. actually another question mm -hmm. are you still are you like um building on that are you still absolutely entering call of deer data from different studies or whatever yep 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 we're right now in the middle of getting some data of large large study from florida um we have also um pennsylvania and i think it's wyoming pennsylvania wyoming i think it's just those two where we get live data so those are deer that are wearing collars all the time and I can also use that to assess the, um, the accuracy of the neural network. Cool. So I can actually wake up on Monday and be like, what do I think the deer are going to be doing in, you know, hmm. PA for this week? I can look at what the prediction is of the model, yeah. and then I can actually let the deer do their thing for a week, and then I can actually gauge how accurate it was. Um, and, you know, 
we kind of came, a lot of people, and I know myself, we kind of come to the table with preconceived notions about what deer, how often deer move, when they move, yeah. what they do, where they go. Um, and then we kind of came out with these first, we, I say generally the hunting, um, collective came out with like, you know, these systems where it's like all the deer are going to stand up at 3 PM on Monday, you know? So it was like high movement at 3 PM on Monday. And you're like, okay, that makes sense. Now I need to be in the tree stand 3 PM Monday. We almost never see that in the data where just, you know, all of the deer decide to start moving a lot at 3 PM. In fact, we never see that in the data. What you'll have are bell curves of general movement patterns that happen over long periods of time. And it makes sense because deer are programmed really to do two things and it's feed and to mate. Yeah. Um, so if food has been scarce, then you're going to see more movement for a longer period of time in order to make up for those fat stores. If food is plentiful, then you'll see more patternable movement for a longer period, shorter periods of time um, because they're less worried about availability of food. And then as you see movement surrounding the rut, it's like, okay, how many favorable feeding days and how active can these bucks be during seeking and chasing during this time of the day in this area based on how much food they've had to get ready for it because they're going to deplete something like 30 to 40% of their body mass during the rut. So if you've had a drought in an area and the weather has been poor and there's not been great feeding and wind directions are changing constantly for erratic weather, you can expect less movement from bucks, especially mature ones, uh, and more nocturnal movement um, during the nighttime hours because of pressure and uh, fat stores. Mm. So you, you can't think about deer in like the hour by hour it's going to be, if they're moving more, they're moving more for many days. Because a lot of times the neural network will predict like five or six days of full range movement. And people will be like, deer aren't just going to move a lot for five or six right. days. And I'm like, well, if you are starving, yeah. you don't just feed yourself and you're satiated. Now you have the fat stores right. from one meal. You need to be moving for many days exactly. in order to get your fat stores back up to where you were before until you feel comfortable. Until then, you're generally going to be moving more. Yeah. And then a lot of guys will be like, well, I use the app throughout, you know, November and it and it said you know full range a lot of the days which is like more than normal movement and very abnormal pattern for the whole month yeah and I'll be like makes sense that makes total sense to me <laughs> like yeah. uh, uh, the like only time I expect a lot of normal um, movement patterns is early and late in the season yeah and that's what we do see in the data is there when food is available and it, especially in the early season when there's food everywhere yeah. and it's growing and there's buds everywhere on plants you know You'll see a lot of movement that can be very abnormal in pattern. And then during the end of the season, you'll see a lot of movement that's normal in pattern because the food sources are depleted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So people have these preconceived notions about what deer movement is. But right. then if I were to show you an actual GPS collar, it's like a roller coaster. It's like lots and lots and lots yeah. of movement, not a lot of movement right. for many days, lots and lots and lots of movement, and then not much. And, and that's just the way that it is. Um, and then you'll get onesies or twosies where there'll be a day where there's lots of movement. So, so on the opposite end of that, it might be that you have many days of core area movement and then one day where there's a ton of movement. Um, and, and that can be because, uh, you know, deer patterned to an area where there was a particular wind direction and that wind direction made it suitable for them to feed in a particular area. But then that wind direction shifts and then now it's, it hasn't been suitable and now it's suitable to hit that soybean field yeah. or whatever. And they're relying less on buds. And then you'll see a lot of movement for like a day or two because yep. it's the area that they're used to now. So there's sure. just the variance is just, again, it's only suited for an artificial intelligence to yeah. do those types of things. If you want prediction, yeah, you know, which there's obviously a market for prediction because for sure. um, people want to uh, account for their time. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely, definitely. I mean, man. You only have so much mental bandwidth to right. consider you know, the variables at play exactly. and also stack those variables, like you said, like 10 days prior, right? right? It's like, you know, today's movement is really, you know, you can predict that, I guess, to a degree on, you know, whatever the 10 days prior, what, yeah. you know, how are we, yeah, yeah um, absolutely. Or even just, you know, just hundred percent history. That's like, it's it, crazy stuff. And then all, I mean, and then you got, you kind of got, or you did get into the back half of that question was like integration of trail cams because you, you kind of have this, uh, regional you know prediction based on variables but then you know you're inputting data points from you know yeah. stuff that's happening exactly where you're at yep yeah, and we are doing that and um actively and passively and i can you know next time i see you guys it'll probably be um a part of the suite of tools but yes we'll, we'll we will be doing that as well and i think it'll happen in a way that people will really like and really Sweet. enjoy i can show you guys some stuff afterwards yeah, that's awesome 
that's what I like about it. It's, you know, awesome imagery. It's something that you can use it as in-depth or as as uh, high level as you want to. You know, it's kind of like an a la carte thing. If you want to really go hook, line, and sinker into the data side of stuff, like that's there. If you want to use it as an app and that just is like purely a, a mapping application, that's an option too. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. I think as hunters too, like you just like you want, like we like to learn. Like I always like to say like we're amateur biologists, right, in, in, in yeah. some capacity. Mm-hmm. But also... Um, like just learning all those things. Like if if you were just like, let's say you used the app for five years or something yeah. like that, and then like you would just like you would learn so much, and then like you would be just become better because you're like, oh, now yeah. I'm considering these are things yeah. that maybe I wasn't considering before. Exactly. Yeah, it, it kind of encourages you to like expand your worldview on yeah the the thing that we talked about earlier with like the upper third of the ridge. You know, yeah. like mm-hmm. yes, but this you know and i think that's it's the but this that i think you kind of get your your mind opened up to a little bit which is obviously like you to be a good hunter you got to adapt you got to grow you got to learn on the fly and if if that helps i think that's a huge takeaway for folks yeah and that's the whole goal with what we're trying to do here is just that data those data points and all of those i started the conversation with isolating on all those variables accounting for them and then providing the information excuse me, for the hunter to make the informed decision yep. um, on when they want to do it. And, you know, it, that, that's, that, that's the whole point of it. And, um, you know, to the people that, you know, I always equate it with, like, people, I, I don't remember who it was. Maybe it was Dan Johnson. I was on his podcast. I think it was maybe him. had asked me, like, what would you say to the people on the ethics side of giving people too much power or data to make these decisions? Like, are you removing the fair chase? And I, my answer to that has always been, it's no different than if you're hunting your grandpa's property that has hunted, he's hunted that property for 60 years. Knows how it works. And he knows exactly how the yep. deer navigate it. He knows where the tree stands are. Or it's like on public land when you're out scouting and you find like an old wooden tree stand yep. somewhere. It's like someone risked their neck yeah. <laughs> to put a stand up there so they, for a reason. Exactly. So you're, yep. you're taking advantage of years and years and years of people making notes about a particular area whether it's that old tree stand or it's your grandfather right and then for you know and so additionally i would say to you is it is it is it am i do i have an ethics problem by asking my grandfather where i should set this stand up or this guy who's been hunting this land forever do i have an ethics problem when i engage with them and i would say of course no um but then also uh not everyone has a grandfather or a father and they want to get into hunting and they're afraid to do it um, or they don't understand everything that goes into it. Maybe they are taking in podcasts now and they're trying to learn. Now this is the tool that can allow them to actually apply that knowledge and centralize it so they can go out there and make sense of the unknown. Because I mean, you kind of talked about it before by saying we're all amateur biologists, but we all are also trying to kind of act act out our own little hero cycles where we are confronted with a problem we, we walk into the unknown, we make sense of it, and then we pull out a trophy. Yep. Um, and, you know, whether that's a white-tailed deer or that's, you know, um, a hog or whatever it is, whatever we're trying to do, and it doesn't even have to be in the hunting realm. It can be in any place, right? Mm-hmm. Confront the unknown, make sense of it, grab something of value, and bring it back for everyone else to enjoy. Totally. Like, that thing is something that we all want to engage on. And I grew up, you know, my father died when I was five. Um, I had a mother, single mother that raised me. Um, I didn't have the money or the ability or the time to go out and do these things and really didn't have anyone to learn them from. Uh, it wasn't until I was older where I started interacting with people to teach me these things. So if I can, you know, just let, you know, for 39 bucks, you know, or, you know, 30 bucks with a discount code, a kid can have something where there's this much for them to learn and then listen to some podcasts like y'all's and kind of put it together for themselves. Like, I can't think of a better story. Yeah, um, exactly to move this culture forward than that story. You know what I'm saying? Like it's all easy when your parents own a ton of property. I'm not poo pooing people who own property. I want to own hunting property one day of my own and go and hunt it. Like I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the story of somebody who's forced to go hunting with their uncle every week and knows where the stands are and this and this and this and this, that's one experience and it can be great and it can be fun and it can cause the deer jitters and it can do all of those things for those little ones and keep them engaged in hunting. That's all great and it's a great story and I want that story for my son. Like I told you guys when we first met, like I'm trying to get my son into hunting. There's a separate story where someone does this all on their own and they're getting dropped off by their mother on their way to work 
at a piece of public land on the way to her restaurant that she works at yeah. where he's taken in some podcasts or she's taken in some podcasts. Now they have an application that's going to make sure they're not getting lost exactly. and they are picking the right day and they're going out there and they're harvesting an animal. And that story is a story I'm very interested in um, and that I want to propagate into the future. Totally. Yeah. Yep. It's empowering. You know, it's a tool. It's a tool to, you know, be less in the learning curve, you yeah. know. And and you can make it what you want. Well, and like you touched on, I mean, it's like less in the learning curve, and and everybody everybody has access to different resources, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody might have access, like you said, to you know, ten thousand acres of the most prime private, amazing resource. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I the imagery. I, I, wish, I wish I knew that yeah. person. The, uh, the imagery only, you know, we have five centimeter imagery. In other words, for about forty percent of the U.S., if you have a five centimeter object on the ground, you should be able to see it with our imagery. Okay. That was only available to the U.S. military, NSA, and NRO um, 15 years ago. You know what I'm saying? And it was a multi-billion dollar asset. You know, you needed to have satellites in space and machine learning and artificial intelligence and coordination efforts and the military running the satellites and the cameras and LEO, GEO, or HEO synchronous orbit. All of these things had to be put together and then you had to look at it on a computer and 15 years later, I can make it available to a 12-year-old on a phone. Gosh, right. that is you know? bizarre. I mean, in that detail, I mean, that is an important yeah. thing. And, and actually, that brings it up. So, like, we're going now we're going really long. But, you know, uh, that high-level detail. And then I think, so if I was reading correctly or something like that, you have, like, leaf cover on, leaf cover off. Yeah, the most of option. that five centimeter to it's five to fifteen centimeter um, imagery. That's got about I think the actual number is about thirty seven percent coverage, and it's expanding every time you see we yep. update. You'll see there's more and more and more. Mm-hmm. Um, that averages between three and seven years of historical imagery that's taken every six months. Okay. Um, cool. So you can look at f- leaf on and leaf off in all of those areas with that imagery, and we're expanding it greatly, and we're doing contracts with other companies right now. Um, to expand that and to um, uh, include that for other places in the U.S. where it's not at right now. So probably by this time next year, we'll, pr- I'm, we'll be well over 60% coverage, I'm guessing. Gotcha. Um, and, and continuing to go forward as we, uh, as we work these things out. And then you have sun-synchronized imagery? Uh, so there's sun-synchronized imagery will be, in a, will be an available feature for download um, it, 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 I'm hoping it happens this year. What you'll be okay. able to do is you'll be able to highlight and we have access to the imagery right now. It's just getting it into the app. We have to hire more people. We can only hire more people as right. we get more users. <laughs> but um, we have the imagery. We have the contract with the company. But what you'll be able to do is draw a polygon around an area and say, I want sun synchronous imagery for this area. So And, and so what will happen is, is the camera is going to be right over top of the imagery. Yeah. And you'll be able to... like. Even with our five centimeter imagery, if it's taken at a angle right now, you're not gonna be able to see things like deer trail or not deer trails, um, logging trails or roads or paths or anything like that. Yep. That could be indicative of deer movement, especially if it's like an abandoned log trail and an abandoned um, a hiking trail somewhere. Deer will take those over and use those for scrapes and rub lines and stuff like that. And so they're good areas to key in on. And so if you can see where a bunch of come together, obviously you'll have things like primary scrapes there. But what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to get that sun synchronous or, um, orbit. And now it's only one to three meter resolution, which means it's about on par with some of our crappier imagery or what like you might get with like an Onyx or another one. It's about one to three meters, what sure. they generally deal in. But it'll be directly over top of the imagery. And yeah. I think I showed it to you yeah. last year. Yeah. It's really awesome because you're able to really discern everything that's going on on that piece of land because it makes all of those things pop Mm -hmm. in a way that you're not used to because most of the imagery these days is being done at an angle. So if you have a bunch of trees standing straight up and you have one narrow path, well, if the imagery is coming at it from an angle, the tree obfuscates. Yep. Yeah, um, you the can't path, see the path. You can't yeah. see it. Whereas if it's straight over top, you can look down on it. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a bit of imagery that's meant to be like blow you away with its accuracy. Yeah. It is an, in, it is a variable to an equation yep. that we are accounting for and allowing hunters. You'll have to order that imagery. Gotcha. So for like 200 acres, it's something like 18 to 20 bucks. Okay. Sure. Um, and, and so that is really for the psychos like yeah. m- myself. Yeah. Like you are, you're, you probably have a problem at this point if you're ordering that, yeah. but I use it all the time. And it's one of my best ways to learn about land that I don't need to set foot on. Um, or, or, or for an instance, in an instance, uh, I can give you a quick example. I was hunting some public land in West Virginia where I did not know there was like a hub of like where like seven trails went together. And it was like in the bottom third of like a bottom. And I just always hunted that mid to top 
yeah. because I, I knew there were trails up there where I'd walk because I was lazy and I didn't go down to these bottoms. Sure. Well, it wasn't until I had access to this imagery and I'd ordered it for this area where I was hunting that I saw there was like this spoke where all of these different paths had come together. And sure enough, there was a massive primary scrape down there um, and all kinds of deer movement down there. Um, and, and, and unless you're willing to cover four or 5,000 acres, you might not ever know it's there. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so really useful in that capacity. Yeah, absolutely. No, I thought it was unbelievable when, when you showed it to me, like the, the contrast from that to something that like shows the shadows, like the detail is, yeah, yeah. very, yeah. very impressive. Well, then, and one thing, and, and maybe you mentioned this too, but like how often, so here's a problem that I run into. Like I'll be doing um, aerial scouting of like, you know, like I love to hunt blacktails in Western Washington. Like, you know, that's, awesome. m- that's my home state and I'm weird and I love to do that. So, um, but so you're, you're trying to like, you know, do your pre-work and you're like, oh, this clear cut looks sick. Like it's like the perfect age. Like, you know, it's just growing up a little bit. The deer are going to feel secure, but there's plenty of browse. You can still see into it, you know, whatever. Then you get there and you're like, oh no, this isn't like a four year old clear cut. This is like a 12 year old clear yeah, cut yeah, or, or yeah. whatever. We're like, yeah, this is a complete reprod. I can't see Jack. Now I've, you know, you know, worked my way back into this logging road system. I've burnt, you know, part of my day because I can't, you know, just go scout that area that yep. I've never been to, you yep. know, um, yep. I'm burning my vacation time yeah. on hunting. So like how often, like, that's definitely something where like, I don't have that. Those landscapes are changing dramatically constantly mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. year to year you know mm-hmm. or, or even like a, a separate thing would be like oh my gosh this is like just this mature timber is going to be awesome i'm going to go through it and it's like oh wait nope that's cut you know yeah. it's gone yeah it's yep. not there like how often does the imagery update? so the 37 percent imagery is done every three to six months okay so that 37 percent and what we're expanding is all the time and we've made a significant investment into that company to make sure that that's getting expanded all the time and we work with them uh one-on-one and then what i'm also doing uh quite separately is uh, negotiating to get these mosaics of imagery that's all within. So right now we are between, we have that 37% that is within the last six months, all of it. In fact, we just uploaded a bunch that is from like a month ago. Mm -hmm. So you're literally seeing imagery that was just taken. Um, That is current all the time. And whatever you see on that, and you can, it's quite obvious in the map when you look at it, it's got a different hue to it. Um, That's, uh, and then the rest of the imagery right now averages between, um, two and four years. So when you start getting out West where there's less people, right. um, we've made buys on imagery there, but the latest round of imagery that I'm negotiating with this company is going to get everything within 18 months. Uh-huh. And we hope to uh, uh, update that every two years. Um, so that I'm hoping will be this year. Sure. Um, there's still some of it out there, but it's, it's, it's more than comparable with what other apps are hosting yeah. in these areas. And a lot of the places that people go to, to get the imagery are the same sources. So I've gone kind of a different route to get some of this imagery from companies that you wouldn't think would be selling it or would be willing to sell it. And I'm just working kind of backdoor deals with them yeah. to get to this stuff. Um, and it's just a, a result of, uh, uh, I was a warrant officer in the military. We're known for our ability to network. So I, I, I don't know the answers, but I know all the guys who know sure. the answers. Um, and that's kind of what I'm doing with Spartan Forge right now is I'm getting kind of these more esoteric sources of this imagery and data and stuff from places that you wouldn't think would be, they wouldn't even think they need to sell yeah. it. Um, mm-hmm. And that's kind of how I'm doing it. Um, and so, you know, if these other companies want to do that, they'd have to find a guy like me who's going to go take someone for dinner five or right. six times and kind of talk to them and convince yeah. them why this is a good idea. But that's what we're doing. So, um it, it's uh it's been exciting and uh this will be our first year where we really have what i would call a fleshed out app last year i kind of just wanted to get the neural networks out there yeah. and get people's input because i knew a lot of people just wanted the neural network and not really interested in anything else um it's funny because i was working with um another mapping company that wanted to hire us um to do the neural network stuff this was years ago um and Right when I I got in the contract and right when I got the contract, I saw that it wasn't set up to benefit us yeah. in any meaningful way. And uh, the, the guy, the CEO of the company was like, don't worry about that. Just know you don't want to build a mapping app. And he said that like three or four times during the conversation, like, don't build your own mapping app. You and don't want to like, do that. I think I do want And that, that was like the moment where I was like, actually, <laughs> I think I want to build a mapping yeah. app. Have you ever seen uh, Dewey Cox, the movie uh, Walk Hard? Oh, okay. Yeah, Where he's yeah, like, yeah. you don't want to do these drugs or whatever. <laughs> and he keeps describing all of the positive features <laughs> of the drugs. He's like, you don't want none of this stuff, dude. Yep. 
uh, he makes all your bad feelings good and makes, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, I kind of feel like I want some. Well, this guy went out on a video call and he's like, trust me, you don't want to, it's such a pain in the butt to build this mapping stuff. You don't want to do this. You don't want to go down that road. Like just stick to the neural networks. You know, yeah. we can make you rich doing it this way and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, A, I'm not super concerned with being rich right now. I just want to hunt for a living. If I can just sustain my, you know, meaningful income sure. and just be able to hunt and write that off as a business expense, Beautiful. I'm good. Like, let's just go. Yep. Um, but when he kept, he said it like four times, maybe like three or four minutes. And then I was like, wait, maybe I do want to. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, actually, I think that's exactly what I want to yeah. do. And we had it built in nine months. So last year- wow. Um, uh, it's actually less than nine months. We had it built in about six months. So last year when it first came out, it was just like a shell of what it's going to be. But I wanted to get the neural networks out there. I wanted to let people know that we were serious. I wanted input on the neural networks and then I knew I would build everything else as we keep going. Like truly building the mapping is the easy part. Yeah. The not easy part is collecting the collar deer data, collecting the, you know, mini sources of weather data, training the neural networks yeah. to, to to do that stuff and then getting these esoteric imagery sources getting all of this back catalog data of weather going back 20 years or 30 years and organizing it all and making it you know the databases that it takes for if you want to pull up a deer camera picture from six years ago and input you know a journal entry on a particular buck and for it to pull the imagery like that's the difficult stuff that's yeah. the, mm -hmm. that that is the 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 long pull in the tent you know making a map appear on a is, you know, you could, honestly, you could make your own mapping app to just drop pins on a map with topo and imagery, and I could do it for you in like six weeks. Like, that is not the difficult part. Um, it's everything else. And it's also, you know, giving them more than just a mapping app. Um, I, I don't even like to think about the company as a mapping app. I like to think of it as a, uh, what would you, I don't even know what to call it, a planning app. It's, yeah. it's got so much more when you start um, uh, peeling away at it than mapping uh, going for it. Um, I like to think of us actually as a machine learning company. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where I, I plan on taking it in the future. Awesome, man. From, from catching bad guys to catching deers. I love it. That's it. Yep. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that is cool, man. I love it. Yeah. I mean, it's just like it's, it's neat stuff. It, it truly, it's it's neat stuff, and, and hearing you talk about it and your background and just kind of where it's at now, is, it's all cool and exciting, and we'll, uh, I guess, see where it goes. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you guys having me here. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, man. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks absolutely. for jumping on the podcast. Yeah. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Yep, thank you. Well, that wraps this episode, everybody. Hopefully, you learned a lot. I know I did. My mind's all twisted up about technology and deer, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.